Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Evolution of the Invertebrate series. Last episode, we chatted about the origin of the eukaryotic cell and introduced the phylogenetics of the protozoa. In this episode, we're going to dive first into protozoan locomotion and then examine the diversity of the SAR supergroup, a multiphyla classification that includes the stramina piles, the alveolates, and the rhizarians. If you haven't watched episode one, you'll find it linked in the description below. In that episode, I said we were going to go over the entire SAR supergroup, but as I was making this video, I found that there was no way I could do justice to this group in a 10-minute video. So we're going to cover locomotion and the stramina piles this week, and we'll finish off the SAR supergroup next week with the alveolates and the rhizarians. So as mentioned last week, the unicellular eukaryotes are limited to be quite small uh, due to their reliance upon passive diffusion for nutrient acquisition and waste removal. This size constraint has interesting implications for how they move and indeed experience the medium in which they move through, which may be water or the bodily fluids of their host. To understand these implications, we need to introduce a concept from physics, in particular from fluid dynamics, called Reynolds number. Reynolds number is the ratio of the inertial and viscous force of a liquid. Specifically, it's defined as the product of the density of a fluid, rho, the flow speed, u, and the size of the object passing through the liquid, l, divided by the viscosity of the fluid, mu. At high Reynolds numbers, liquid movement is turbulent, resulting in drag upon the object. You feel this drag when you're swimming. If you don't actively expend energy to keep moving, the drag of the water will eventually cause you to stop. Furthermore, if you push your hand against uh, the water in a swimming pool, you'll feel the eddy forming and pushing against the back of your hand. This is because you are large enough that you're breaking the flow of the water, causing these little eddies to form behind it. Now, at low Reynolds numbers, generally less than 10, viscous forces dominate. In these instances, the object doesn't break the directional flow of the water. This is called laminar flow, and, the, uh, and this is the fluid dynamic experienced by protozoans. In laminar flow, friction is very strong, and it prevents movement via symmetrical motion. You can think of this as if you were trying to swim through a swimming pool of honey. Right? You can kick your feet in the symmetrical motion all you want, but you will barely move. Instead, protozoans move through water via asymmetrical motion. To demonstrate this, let's introduce two forms of protozoan locomotion. The most basal form is likely the flagella, which is a long whip-like extension of the cell membrane. For most protozoans, the flagella acts like a kind of propeller, pulling them through the water in a helical fashion. Uh, this tends to manifest in a kind of twirling motion, with the net movement being forward. Uh, this would obviously be a terribly inefficient way of swimming at high Reynolds numbers, where turbulence would be pushing against you. But it works very well to avoid the drag of friction in the direction of movement. A second common form of locomotion is via cilia. Cilia are small, hair-like projections that are structurally identical to flagella, except they tend to be densely packed around areas of the cell membrane. Cilia move somewhat like a paddle, with a broad forward stroke, and followed by a retraction backwards, uh, a retracted backward stroke to reset the position for the next front stroke. Uh, this is likely how you'd figure out how to move through a pool of honey. You'd extend your arms forward, pushing really hard back, but when you reset your arms forward, you keep them close to your body to minimize the amount of friction you experience before your next stroke. Again, this is type of asymmetrical motion allows protozoans and humans in pools of honey to move despite the very high viscosity they experience. Now, the last form of locomotion I want to introduce is via pseudopods. As the name implies, they're a kind of fake foot, an amorphous extension of the cell membrane. This kind of motion is fascinating in that it relies on rapidly polymerizing actin fibers at the site of pseudopod formation. These actin fibers are recycled from other parts of the cell and shuttled to the fake foot. 
In this way, pseudopods are a kind of recycled foot, which each new one are composed of the actin that generated the one that came before it. As you might imagine, this mode of locomotion is incredibly slow, um, and it typifies most amoeboid protozoans. So now that we've discussed the locomotory environment of the protozoans, let's dive into the first protozoan taxa of the SAR supergroup. As I mentioned before, these include the straminopiles, the alveolates, and the rhizarians. Let's begin with the straminopiles. Now, the characteristic feature of the straminopiles are the presence of two flagella, one that is decorated with hair-like structures, and the second, that is generally posterior to that one, that is smooth. Uh, the most diverse group of straminopiles, called the straminochromes, all have acquired chloroplasts and thus are capable of photosynthesis. Uh, these include golden algae, brown algae, yellow-green algae, and, of course, the famous diatoms. Uh, while most phylogenetic analyses suggest that the ancestral straminopiles lacked chloroplasts, uh, thus making the acquisition of them a derived characteristic in the straminochromes, some have secondarily lost them and reverted back to heterotrophy. Uh, one such group is the pedinellids, uh, which used to be called heliozoans, meaning sun animals, uh, because of their radiating axopods. Now, despite the paired flagella being an important feature, some have secondarily lost these and are actually primarily amoeboid. Uh, the golden algae, for example, is one example of this and actually have a multinucleate stage similar to many slime molds. An important group of straminopiles is the oomyceta, commonly called water molds. Previously thought to be fungi because of the remarkable similarities in their lifestyles, molecular analysis has placed them firmly within the straminopiles. They are often filamentous, though the most primitive ones tend to be truly unicellular. Uh, um, they are important decomposers of plant matter and are some of the deadliest pathogens of plants. In fact, the most famous is the phytophora, which caused the potato blight in the 1840s and led to the quote-unquote Great Famine in Ireland. Now, the reproductive cycle alternates between asexual and sexual reproduction. The main mode of dispersal is through asexually produced zoospores, uh, which are unicellular, unicellular spores that closely resemble the unicellular straminopiles. That is, they have paired flagella in which one is highly decorated. Uh, sexual spores, called oospores, are often produced to survive harsh environmental conditions uh, as they have thick walls and can live for extended periods of time in water or soil. Now, of course, we can't move on from, from the straminopiles without talking about the Bacillariofaceae. Don't make me say that name again. Better known as the diatoms. Diatoms are incredibly important organisms that are responsible for up to 50% of the oxygen produced each year and absorb over 6 billion tons of silica from the ocean every year. This latter fact is because they construct these tiny shells called frustules of silicate. The shape of these frustules can vary immensely. Some are rod-shaped, while others take on what appears to be perfect geometrical shapes of circles, squares, stars, diamonds, etc. Others are more three-dimensional, including spheres, cubes, and pentagons. Still others are more abstract in their shapes. Diatoms reproduce via binary fission, an asexual splitting of the original cell into identical daughter cells. This creates an interesting conundrum. How do the daughter cells divide up the parental frustral? What happens is one gets a large fraction of it, while the other gets a smaller one that's called the hypotheca that is derived from the parental one. As you might imagine, this results over time in a decrease in the size of the frustules in a population. So to maintain frustral size, diatoms eventually must undergo sexual reproduction. For this to occur, cells undergo meiosis, which leads to daughter cells that are haploid instead of diploid, including generally motile sperm and immobile eggs. It's important to note that not all diatoms have mobile sperm. In the pinnate diatoms, the gametes are both immobile. This is called isogamy. It means that there is no differentiation of the morphology of the gametes. You can't tell sperm and egg apart. They are completely identical. 
So when sperm and egg meet, they form a diploid zygote, and this zygote sheds the frustral and becomes encapsulated in a membranous oxyspore. This allows the cell to grow to maximal size before reforming the frustral, thus re restoring the size of the diatom. As I mentioned before, diatoms are responsible for up to half of the oxygen in the atmosphere and therefore most possess chloroplasts for photosynthesis. Some, however, such as those belonging to the, to the genus Nitschia, are obligate heterotrophs and they lack chloroplasts. Diatoms are also capable of surviving without oxygen or sunlight due to being capable of undergoing nitrate respiration, allowing them to persist for long periods of time under intense environmental stress. Now, the Straminopiles will always have a special place in my heart because when I was an undergrad, I took a philosophy class in which the professor stated, there are no perfect geometrical shapes in nature. Clearly, he had never seen a diatom. Let's review what we've discussed. First, we introduce the concept of Reynolds number, which dictates how an organism experiences movement through a medium. Next, we talked about the three main modes of locomotion in protozoa, cilia, flagella, and pseudopodia. Finally, we introduce the first member of the SAR supergroup, the straminopiles, which includes several groups of algae, diatoms, and water molds. Next week, we'll finish up the SAR supergroup with the alveolata and the rhizaria before moving on the following week to the excavates, which include the discoba and the metanomata. Thanks so much for being here. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below and I'll address them as best as I can. And I'll see you next week for episode three. Thanks.